So I'm gonna always pause the recordings when we listen to music so that we avoid any copyright issues. I am a firm believer in copyright. You know, it is one of the ways, we'll, we'll talk about this in a minute. Um, but when our Zoom recordings are posted on YouTube, then that becomes a public forum. Of course, I can make it private as well, but we have then used the music and it can't be monetized. So then there's an issue in trying to get it posted to our site. So I've decided that what I'll do is I'll just say, and now we're gonna to listen to the overture to Anything Goes, which we just did. And it will be on the pages so that you'll be able to access it. And that way we'll avoid any kind of copyright issue because what that does is it takes you to the YouTube site where they have already promoted the product or the song or the album or the movie or whatever, instead of me sort of co-opting it as part of the class and putting the recording on YouTube. Does that make sense to everybody? I'm looking for your hands, thank you. Um, so just one note about copyright. The, the way that artists get paid is through the copyright process. So a variety of things can be copyrighted. Even costume designs can be copyrighted if you are your own employer. If you are an employee for hire, it is more difficult to get it copyrighted. But the union, United Scenic Artists, Local 829, I'm the Western Region <laughs> Chair, has the copyright um, did achieve copyright for designers, especially designers on Broadway. So just a sec. So copyright provides a sm small sum of money, whether you are a writer and you've published a book, whether you're a songwriter and a song gets played, airplay or sold. We've talked about sheet music and in that when, when we were talking about Tim Pan Alley last week, sheet music was not part of a copyrighted thing. The, um, the publishers would buy the song outright. Of course, that's always a choice because you need the money now, you buy it outright. Just like with any piece of artwork, you can do that. But when you've copyrighted, it means that someone can't use your creative work without your permission. And often then it requires some kind of a payment. We are going to work, look extensively at the musical of Chorus Line. I did a, just a ton of research on it over the weekend. And um, it was fascinating to me to read those stories about Rent and also Chicago, uh, a couple of the other musicals that you picked because it said, you know, it sounds like the stories of a real people. And when you see the, I'm gonna post this, um, we're gonna start working on this soon because I, a chorus line really is an instrumental piece of musical theater. And it was, anybody know the source of the origin, by the way? This ties into the copyright thing as well and into the royalties. Any idea? I mean, of course we know that Michael Bennett was the, um, you know, major wonderkin behind it but he gathered together a group of artists with whom he had been working. He was a dancer. He was a dancer that left school at age 16, was hired into the international tour of West Side Story at age 16. And then by 23, he already had a Tony nomination as a choreographer and an award. I mean, he was just a, just a really a spectacular genius. And Marvin Hamlish said, you know, he had just picked up these three Academy Awards, probably for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and some other things that he did. And Michael Bennett said, you know, I'm working on this little project. Would you come and work with me? And Hamlish said, well, you know, this boy genius called me. I told my agent, we're going to New York. So he gathered these dancers together in a loft and basically they told their stories for, 24 hours, he ended up with 24 hours of reel-to-reel -reel tape like this. So I'm gonna 
uh, post the documentary that has both that and part of the audition process about the revival done in 20, 2006. But each one of those artists then, some of them went on to be in the show. The stories went on to be in the show, even if the artist was not selected to be in the show and they sold their rights for $1. And this was a workshop it started in 1974. It was on Broadway by 1975. It ran for over 6,000 performances. For 15 years, it made Michael Bennett a multimillionaire. And finally, they did renegotiate for some part of the profit. But really, you know, if you, if you are an originator of a television show, and Jim Barrows is one of those, I worked with him on a couple of things. If you're an originator of a television show and you do the pilot, and the pilot's picked up and runs for several years, you get a piece of every single show, whether you're writing for it, doing anything for it or not, because you were the originator and of any um, times that they replay them on television or on computer or stream it. So to have theater artists in particular be left out of any kind of gravy train, which is really typical, is sort of a travesty. And we need to think about that. Anyway, that whole long thing to just say, that's why we're not going to, I'm not gonna use the Zoom to post materials that are copyrighted, we'll just go to the site. So anyway, <laughs> sorry, that was kind of long-winded, but it is something that I am extremely passionate about because I feel like it is hard enough to get paid and make a living as a visual artist, like I am as a costume designer working professionally, which I did for 25 years before I came back here in 2011. And um, it's hard as an actor. We see these very, very popular actors that are making you know a ton of money. But of the hundred and, sorry, I have a hair in my mouth. I was like, what's going on? Oh, it's just, it's connected. Um, but, you know, of the, the statistics used to be, you know, of the 200,000 people that are in sag after 2,000 of them made their insurance every year. Yeah. So you hear about, you know, point, not even 1% of the people are making the big bucks. And if you're making a living, like, you know, you're making 80,000 or more a year, you're doing well. You're truly a huge success in that world. So we need to think about how tenuous the life is and how tenuous the existence is for all artists. It's a huge risk. And we have really survived the pandemic on the backs of entertainment by having entertainment streamed to us, by having it available on discs, by having it available on other, uh, you know, Spotify songs, uh, even these incredible recordings that we get to look at are really, really fortunate. And you guys know about Canopy? I'm gonna put it in the chat. This is a, uh, I don't know, it's a, I don't, you correct me. It's through the library and you can, there are, they, it's a, a repository for old movies. So I'm gonna, I'm trying to get some old movie musicals so we can watch them that way. So that'll be really fun. You can do it with your library card. Okay. Let's listen to one other thing before we go into the lecture. We're gonna talk about different components of musicals. We sort of ended with um, the end of Tin Pan Alley. And then I did go ahead and, and share the complete PowerPoint where we didn't quite get all the way through last time. And you can, I, or I sort of summarized it, which we'll take a look at. And then we're going on to ending the 20s, the end of in the 1920s, in 1929 with the crash, we have a sudden shift from the <clears throat> gaiety of the, the carefreeness, the absolute frenetic 
sound that we got, the new sound of jazz, the, the um, not using regular meter, sliding around the measures, sliding around the beat, which also was indicating in how people were living, <clears throat> sliding around the law, prohibition. Oh yeah, like that made people didn't drink, no. So, you know, all of this sort of movement of the 20s then in 1929 with the stock market crash was really an abrupt and sudden change. Then when we move into the 1930s, we start getting a different view, a bit more, a bit less carefree, more pointed, more sophisticated, more edgy. So let's take a quick look at that. I'm just gonna go to find it and then we'll start. Did anybody review the material from last week to see what is up there? So this is the jazz influence decade from 19, 1919 to 1929. We listened to A Pretty Girl is Like a Melody, which influenced the Ziegfeld Follies and influenced Flo Ziegfeld into creating these women as basically structures. They became a structure that simply walked around on the stage, that they no longer needed to actually sing or dance. They could just simply be beautiful. One other really instrumental piece is Shuffle Along. First published, this is, this is, okay, this is, this is the original artwork for Shuffle Along here, these two pieces. I'm sorry that this um, has, shifted over this 2016 revival should go with this piece of art, the Music Box Theater revival 2016 starring Audra McDonald, who is a five-time Tony winner. One of the famous songs from that is from the song in 1921, You're Just Wild About Harry. We'll take a quick listen to it. And it is from used again during Harry Truman's presidential campaign. No, no, Nanette, you can take a listen to this yourself in 1925, T for Two was the first tour to travel to Europe and was then translated into several European languages, not with a necessarily a literal translation, but because it was metric, it was in a beat, the words were, were written to go with the song. The, um, the country could put their own flavor into that kind of nonsensical words that became, that were from T for two. Let's just listen to this, You're Just Wild About Harry and imagine that it, oh shoot, sorry, I have to change that to 1948, but it's done in 21 and then 37 years later for a campaign. Of course, the name recognition is everything. I'm gonna, uh, how can I do this? Okay. A really beautiful campaign song for um, Harry Truman. I want you to look at this photo for just a moment. Part of what we need to think about with musicals is expanding our attention to detail and how we actually see things. So of course we have the name up here. This is Noble, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, S-I-S-S-L-E. So I say Cicely and U.B. Blake. U.B. Blake has a entire musical written about him in the seventies later. So they have a long and prosperous career and are great, very popular. But my interest is in this photograph down here. I love looking at real people 
these are people from the production. They're not Vogue magazine models, which of course we did have Vogue still then. We had all kinds of fashion illustrations and that sort of thing. But what can we gain from looking at what real people look like? So I love the fascination. You can immediately place this into 1921 by the length of the skirt and the lack of a waistline. Waistline came in 1927. We started getting a little ribbon around the waist. So you have this beautiful sheath dress, drop waist with stockings and matching shoes. Also a woman back here wearing a very similar thing, here wearing a black dress also. And of some slightly older styles here that have a little more cloth, you'll even see people wearing, I'm trying to look at the, uh, no, I can't, I can't really zoom in any further. I'm trying to look to see about the details, but this is not a winter image because this is in New York. So it must not be summer either because it could, it could, I take that back. I was gonna say it's not summer because we have people wearing overcoats. She's wearing an overcoat. The men are wearing their suit jackets, but they're carrying straw boaters. So that's an indicator of a certain season of time, okay? We have a wide variety of apparel. This person's wearing more of a cutaway coat. This person's wearing more of a sack jacket. This would be a jacket and pants that match, jacket and pants that match. This cutaway would be not necessarily a jacket and pants that matches. And notice there seems to be no waistcoat underneath here. A bow tie, a foreign hand, which is a long tie. So a wide variety of neckwear for men a wide variety of necklines. This, this baton neck, which is scooped over, seems to be popular, a string of pearls. The bobbed hair, look at that, almost to a woman. The bobbed hair is this wild craze that goes through. Because think about it, you can, if you cut your hair, prior to this woman had long hair that was worn in a bun. It definitely, when you were um, of age or you became married, you could no longer wear your hair down. So you had to wear it styled in a specific way. But I want you to think about shaking your head with this kind of hair. Like it just gives you all the movement in the world. So try to get into the spirit of the time period with this, like the shaking of the hair, the skirts that move, the legs are exposed. You know, this is a really a departure from 1921. 1919 is the end of World War I. We're wearing skirts down to here. So that has happened very, very quickly. And of course, brought on by 1920s, women's suffragette, women got vote. So a very fascinating part. I love looking at that kind of thing because it just gives us a slice of life into that time period. And not only that time period, but also into, I think I, I, think I just uh, lost my background because I didn't make this smaller. Now, there we go. Um, but it gives us a real slice of life. You can imagine what do those people look like, right? So I think that's a really important thing to remember. Take a look at the images. What were they thinking? How were they living? How were they surviving? It was, if there, sure, there was an, area of, an era of great prosperity, but not everybody was rich like today. You know, how many rich people do you know? I certainly wouldn't put myself in that category. So um, I want to just show you the last part of this, the amazing decade, which is a significant amount of um, slides we talked, and thank you Colby for bringing in vaudeville when you talked about Chicago. Things that we are discussing now, when you have, do any kind of a review, you want to be able to bring in all the things that we've talked about in the past. So let's take a look at this. When we, are you seeing high class vaudeville? Right here? No. No, it says wanted to write a new type of musical show needs. Okay, all right. That's what I thought. I thought that's what happened. I thought that sneaky little thing went that way instead of the way I wanted. So I have to pick. This one. 
Now you're seeing high class five L, right? Yes. Okay, thank you, Colby. I'm thinking, wait, what am I seeing now? Okay, so we had Florence Ziegfeld, which we discussed, the Follies from 13 to 27 with George, Joseph Urban. Remember, that's the new stagecraft designer that brought in things like uh, new stagecrafts from Europe, but also things like turntable, the in one, which the curtain came down, there could be a small uh, vignette in front of it, then the curtain could open and create this huge um, scene behind it. Lady Duff Gordon, who was an incredible costumier, which means that she both designed and constructed garments. She introduced live mannequins in her fashion salon. This is what inspired Flo Ziegfeld to transform the chorus girls into showgirls. And that's when a pretty girl is like a melody became their anthem. They are an object of desire, uh, glamour, visible and inaccessible look, but don't touch, but you think you can touch them. So that is even more exciting. So then we have, I just wanna make sure, am I recording right now? <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes, you are. Okay, I don't have it on my screen when I'm doing it. So it is, yeah, it says, thank you for that. So there's much more than Ziegfeld, okay? We have the Schubert brothers, the passion shows, 12 editions from 12 to 24. This, so the, the thing that, that Ziegfeld made was exceedingly popular. And this is all this frenetic energy that's happening during the 1920s. And that's why it's called the Roaring Twenties. People were just going along like crazy. It's the first time we really get cars, motorized vehicles happening in cities we're suddenly traveling much faster and, and people don't know how to drive. You know, that was, that it was not like driving now where you have everything automatic. There were a lot of people as trial and error. <laughs> you know, they were hitting horses, horses were dying, horses were laying on the side of the road. It was, uh, people were driving horses, so it was crazy. So here's a, one critic writing about the passing show which was just at the Winter Garden with the Schubert brothers. Remember the Schubert brothers still produce today. Schubert Theater in New York on Broadway, they are still a major force. But one critic wrote, the girls come absolutely within your grasp. They wore full evening dress, modern style and slowly crossed the auditorium so you could see how full the evening dress wasn't. Many of these costumes were transparent. In your book, there's some uh, illustrations by Erte, who was a Russian that refers to his initials, but he goes by E-R-T-E. And some graphic design really influenced in the 1920s. Earl Carroll, The Vanities, 11 editions through 1940. And by now we're in World War II. And that's probably what puts a stop to it, emphasizing male comedians and female nudity. So what does this sound like? Strip clubs, right? Um, body or reviews, burlesque comedians and strippers, Jack Benny, Joe Cook, Jimmy Sabo, and Milton Berle. Now Jack Benny and Milton Berle were still wildly popular even through the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, in the 1980s. So they've been around a long time and they have what we'd call long legs. They're comedians that have great long legs. They last for a long time. George White is a former Ziegfeld Hoofer. A Hoofer is a tap dancer. He brought 1920s song and dance into his own production called Scandals. They did 13 editions. And he used, he focused on dance. And this is what actually got me into chorus line because Michael Bennett, of course, was a dancer. Chorus line is about dancers. So George White did it first. He focused on dancers. Still, it is a review. Sterling dancers, Ann Miller, you can see her in any number of movies as well as a dancer. Ann Pennington, Eleanor Powell. Ann Pennington introduced Black Bottom, which was a sens sensational dance and very risque. Singers Rudy Valley and Ethel Merman. George White introduced Ethel Merman, 
We're going to see Ethel Merman again when she starts working with George Gershwin, who just, just like falls in love with her voice. She's this new thing that he found. It was just, he couldn't believe her. You know, she didn't have a wavering voice. She has what's called the belt. We'll talk about that today also. So he is the first to feature George Gershwin. So George Gershwin meets Ethel Merman at this very early age. The music box reviews are intimate reviews. So Hollywood has musical films with synchronized sound starting in 1927, and they can do grander spectacle. They can do everything with more venues and lower ticket prices. If you can go see the Penny Show at the movies, why would you be going to see the review on Broadway? If you're living in Seattle, you're not getting that kind of a review anyway, but you can go to the Nickel movies. So music box reviews are neither a skin show nor long live. In other words, they're not gonna last for 12 years, but they're gonna be one of a kind productions, more like what we're familiar with in today. And here we have The Little Show, starting in 1929, Three's a Crowd, 1930, 1934, 31, The Bandwagon, and As Thousands Cheer are really instrumental pieces that shove us forward out of the 20s into the 30s. But this idea of an intimate venue with this different kind of a production that is not a skin show, but high quality entertainment. The bandwagon made Broadway history with innovative stage design. Lights from the balcony replaced footlights. They were set into the stage floor. Mirrors tilted on the stage, turntables set the stage spinning and the set designer was Albert Johnson. So I remember the first time I saw a turntable and I thought, wow, that's so cool. And then I find, oh yeah, they're doing that in the twenties. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking you gotta be kidding me, Pam. After 50 years, you still have so much to learn. But um, you know, it's, it is amazing the kinds of technology that they could incorporate even at this, what we would consider a very rustic way. But you know, they still had engineers and they had people that were interested in doing innovative work. They featured amazing dancers. This is where Fred Astaire and Adele Astaire, the brother sister team were first discovered in bandwagon. So they would become, you know, part of one of the featured pieces of this review. Ballerina Lily Loesch, comedians, Helen Broderick and Frank Morgan. The review of running time was approximately one third comedians then the other two thirds was roughly two to one musical numbers versus non-musical. A musical number could include a singer, a dancer, a pair of dancers, a dance number. So consistency is what's creating the unified tone and the point of view here. A single team of songwriters, Howard Dietz and Art Schwartz, Dancing in the Dark. A single team of scriptwriters, Dietz and George F. Kaufman. So when you work with these individuals, this really creates a particular voice for the piece. And that helps the consistency. There's no smutty jokes, no devastating wisecracks, no heavy-handed gags. You know, we're not just uh, slapping like Punch and Judy. It's not broad physical comedy. Another really important piece as Thousands Cheer has now changed the review has a theme. Before that, we didn't really have a plot. We had things that held together consistently because of their songwriters and composers, but now we have a theme. And the theme is a newspaper come to life. The current events of 1933 are set as a series of vignettes and it's identified by headlines unified style and point of view. So the sketches were written by Moss Hart, who is someone that continues into the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Songs and lyrics by Irving Berlin. We learned about him. He wrote over a thousand songs. Easter from Easter Parade, In Your Easter Bonnet, to Heat Wave, a completely different kind of song. Each vignette is a self-contained number and the thematic link but it is a thematic link to the rest of the review. And some of the stars were, again, we see 
Ethel Waters, a great American, African-American singer, Marilyn Miller, a Singfield song and dance protege who was really a difficult woman to work with apparently. Ellen Broderick, a deadpan comedian, and one of the few female comedians, and Clifton Webb, a song and dance man. So we have musical comedy and musical farce. Farce is gonna be a more exaggerated, uh, more physical form of comedy, a comedy where they can take things um, much further. The antics can be much more outrageous without consequence. And part of that is that farce gives us an escape valve as a society, which we are really looking forward to at this time. It's entertainment for the masses, a musical comedy. It's not too dignified. And we just talked about this last week also about the vernacular. Things are in the common vernacular. People want to come and see them. Librettist, lyricist George Gard, Bud De Silva, Lou Brown, and composer Ray Henderson. They are collaborators on George White's White Scandals, so 1925 and many other editions. They've had five musical comedy hits in the 1920s. They were the most prolific team of the era. They specialized in novelty ballads, Birth of the Blues, You're the Cream in My Coffee, and then Peppy Dance Twos, Button Up Your Overcoat when you're feeling blue. So there's all these kinds of things that um, you can look up and see exactly what they sounded like. In tune with the times, they understood their limitations. So in other words, you know, you, they can't write classical music. They know that. What they're gonna do is write the best music that they can within their limitation. And that is such an incredible thing to know about yourself. What is your comfort level? How far can you push beyond that? and then know that you're not gonna write opera. You know What you're doing is where your place is and it's gonna be a great place and you can excel in that place. We all look for that. They knew their audience and they could write to that. They provided opportunities for great stage clowns. Now these people, if you've not heard of them, Ed Wynn, Victor Moore, Bert Lahr, Jimmy Durante. Ed Wynn was in the very first Mary Poppins movie. And he played a, an important part as a, like an uncle. And he was, it was in this song called I Love to Laugh. And he's the one that explodes and then starts floating up to the ceiling. It's a, a phenomenal comedian. So that was in hmm, the sixties, right? Mary Poppins, the first one with Julie Andrews. So he's still going in the sixties from the twenties. Bert Lahr was the Cowardly Lion in 1939, Wizard of Oz, and then continued on past that. Jamie Durante was in uh, movies through the 60s, um, and he always had follow my nose, the big schnoz Ola, because he had a very large nose and he used it for part of his um, shtick. His, his signature was his nose. So comedy or farce, comedy embraces the same themes as tragedy, pursuit, passionate pursuit. Let's not forget passionate pursuit of love, power, wealth, ambition, conflicts, cost of pursuit in human terms, but comedies make audiences laugh. Tragedies make them feel pity, terror, and catharsis. And sometimes you learn more from a comedy than you do from a tragedy. And sometimes you actually feel better from a comedy because even though you can have catharsis through this feeling of pity and terror, laughter aerates your oxygen flow and will actually physically cheer you up. It creates a chemical response in your body. And laughter is one of the things that has been known to really help you learn things. That was the thing that in that I told you, I was looking at the humor from Stanford. It's a, um, a class in humor and they talk about how can you create a, a workplace or an environment? And so I'm starting, I'm thinking about how can I create this online classroom in an environment that's not only safe, but is uplifting and has humor and makes you feel better at the end of the day than worse. So that's my goal. I think that it's really worth it there's a lot of times we should just laugh and bring that in and, and laugh at ourselves, laugh at other things, laugh at something silly that you see happening on the street or, or 
maybe you just see a brilliant, brilliantly colored flower. This time of year, you're going to see things. Sorry, that may not be you, Casper, yet. But here in California, we're seeing things like cherry blossoms. We're seeing roses coming out. We're seeing all kinds of flowers just like aching to burst into vibrant view. And that just brings a smile to my face. It's just an incredible um, encouragement and validity of rebirth. So they're making it. We're going to make it. Comedy has that, has that ability for you. Farce and comedy have a common pool of situation and devices. Mistaken identity, disguise, cross-dressing, puns, innuendo. We're not really saying this. Are we really saying this? What are you getting out of this? You're getting the same thing I am? Chases, oh yeah, let's run around the stage. Let's slam doors, let's hide in closets. Ribaldry. Comedy uses these as a means to reflective end. What are we supposed to be thinking about? How does this get us a better understanding? And farce, no greater need than the moment. All we're doing is we're just appreciating the athleticism of them running up and down those stairs or falling down the stairs or falling down into the cellar or whatever they're doing, it's an escape escape from our day-to-day -day life, release of the pressure of today, like whew, let it go. It's a regression to the irresponsibility of childhood where, you know, we didn't know any different. And if we did, we didn't care. But it's a great thing to see someone else act that way. And then there's no consequences because it is actually pretend. Car, you made a great statement yesterday about seeing something where now, because you've had so much effects work in makeup, you know that this is let's pretend so your mind is more easily accepting of those visual things. And that's the same way with farce. We know it's let's pretend, we're seeing them act that way out on stage. So it draws its greatest strength from the performers. We come back to the performer. The performer excels at the timing, the physicality, the breakneck delivery, rapid fire, the scripts are a blueprint written to the performer's abilities. Wow, how would you like to do that? Oh yeah, we're writing to this. So here's some very specific examples of famous people that were had very specific things. The Marx Brothers are here in the 1920s before these famous um, skits become movies. They're actually cherry picked from Broadway to movies. And believe it or not, this still happens today. When I was working on Grace Under Fire, Carsey Warner would cherry pick people off of Broadway and playwrights in New York. And that's how I got to work with Alan Ball. And Alan Ball is, uh, came and worked on Grace Under Fire. He's the one that wrote American Beauty. He wrote True Blood, he wrote Six Feet Under, and he was cherry picked from a playwright to come and write for TV. And then he wrote for movies and became a producer. So still Broadway and theater are recognized as incubators for incredible innovative creative talent. And that's something that we should take, keep in mind. And now as movies get more and more expensive, it's even worth it more to find these brilliant creators who are willing to risk everything for live performance. Because one thing in live performance, I worked with a, with a, a very influential commercial director and I thought, oh man, commercials, you know, it's like not as cool as TV, it's not as cool as movies. And then I realized, wow, you know, they make, they have more money to spend on 30 seconds than you do in that whole movie. And plus I was making way more money. I was making twice the money on a commercial that I was working on a movie. So I talked to him once and I said, hey, Joe, Joe Pitka, P-Y-T-K. I said, hey, Pitka, what do you, uh, what do you think about theater? He said, no. He said, I like to call cut because I want to control everything the audience sees. When you're in live theater and that performer goes out on the stage, you really don't know what they're going to do. So it is a risk. It's a very, very interesting risk. Even with someone as magnetic and powerful as Pitka would not take the risk on directing theater because there's not enough control. So that's another whole side of the live performance that we don't have. Things happen and you have to be able to respond in the moment. Lyricists write to the performer's style. Gersh Ira Gershwin 
George's brother, Rip, wrote in the clipped symbols of comedian Walter Catlett, which meant he wrote in staccato. If, he's, if he talks very quickly, then he's going to write his notes very quickly. So it's, it's an interesting response to, again, when I ask you, what is the dialogue? How is the dialogue unfolding? What is that in relationship to the music? And start thinking about those things when we're thinking about musical theater. Lyricists who failed to write the performer style risked being on the warpath <laughs> of the performer. They're in the, they're in the shotgun. Okay, the jazz age, the 1920s was fluid, unstable, right? We're talking about everything is moving a lot of moving parts. It was first used in 1916 to name this rough and sexy type of African-American music. That's us looking back at trying to coin the phrase then. You know, I'm sure that in 1916, they're not saying, oh yeah, jazz, what exactly is that? And they're making a definition. It's happening. And they can't really put a finger on it. There's no clear definition. You can't look it up in the Webster's yet, right? Any syncopated mass marketed popular tune was part of jazz. Gershwin, this would be George, Gershwin considered it American, more sweet than hot. So there's this thing about hot and sexy. Created acceptability for the genre of jazz. He embraced it fully. It's like, this, this is here. We, this is giving us great creative freedom. We love sliding around these notes. We love sliding around these time signatures. It was not the sustained melodies of classical music. It didn't follow that format of classical, of, of what we know from opera, of what we know from Bach and Mozart. We are living in the age of staccato, not legato. Staccato, short clip notes, legato, long drawn out notes. The change in perception of time itself, there's the sensation of the experience of speeding up in modern life. Vincent Humans, 1898 to 1946, reworked songs into new formats to speed them up. So he took songs that were already existing and then put them into different time signatures and used different instrumentation. Very clever. And now we'll see that in the very next period in the 30s where people are doing that with the book. The first big musical comedy hit, No, No, Nanette, with Sammy Lee, who attempts to express the jazz crazed age through dance. This was a sensation. And well, we should play some music from that. The first show to tour to non europe non-English speaking countries. This is the one we looked at where T for two was from there. Lyrics are transmitted, translated rhythmically, not specifically literally. So T for two is T for two, two for T. Me for you, you for me. So in any language, you can still use the same rhythm. Um, I'm sparing you my singing at that moment. His Broadway career from 1920 to 1932 was the length of the jazz age. He did 12 Broadway book shows, No, No, Nanette being one of the most famous. Hit the Deck and Take a Chance. He did operettas, Wildflower and Through the Years, and he did musical plays, Rainbow and Great Day. Soon these differences are going to go away and we're gonna end up with one genre. His life is cut short by tuberculosis at age 48. That is a really short time to have done all of this work. So, 1925, he's 27 years old and having his first big hit. What is Broadway dance doing at this time? And this reminds me of Serafina's question to the lyricist, do you write for the, how do you write for dance? How do you include a dance break? So they're, the big four young Broadway dance directors are Sammy Lee, Seymour Felix, Busby Berkeley, and Bobby Conley. Busby Berkeley should be a, Familiar word to you, there were a lot of movies made with the Busby Berkeley girls. They're called dance directors, not yet choreographer. This is not coined until the 1930s with George Balanchine, where he is demanding to be called a choreographer. So some of these people working into 19, living to 1975, clearly into the 20th century. 
but all of them born in the 19th century. Imagine the change that they saw with actually <clears throat> physical conditioning. The physical conditioning of the human body changed drastically in the 1960s post the fitness uh, mandate by President Kennedy. It's like everybody needs to get fit and suddenly we're, we're in a fitness nation, particularly in the United States. Five basic dance styles at this time. Ballet, toe dancing, classical dancing, and character dancing. Exhibition dancing, which includes foxtrot. This would be two a pair, okay? This would be Fred Astaire and his sister Estelle. Foxtrot can be very quick, one step and the waltz. This is waltzes in three, four time. So it's ba da 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 and where foxtrot and one step are basically uh, either two, four or four, four times. So they're even. Acrobat dancing, which is includes, this is crack of it, it's called dancing, but it's, they are dancing and they include back bends, cartwheels and splits. And I really appreciated this and you'll see it in this, a chorus line where one woman comes, she has finished her audition. She's done an amazing job they say, thank you very much. And she exits to leave the stage. And as she's leaving, she does a cartwheel. And I thought, oh yeah, there's that acrobatic dancing. Tap and step dancing, which is buck and wing, waltz clog, soft shoe. This is without, soft shoe is without taps, okay? Taps are metal devices that are put on the bottom of your shoes to increase the sound and the percussiveness of the foot. And then we have double taps where there's a small metal square put inside of that. And then you hear a ch -ch, instead of just ch -ch, you hear ch -ch with every single footfall on the stage. And so it, it creates a really incredible percussive sound. These five basic dance styles are the sum of musical comedy dancing. It is a true musical comedy dancing when it's a cross between ballet and tap and step, which is an American specialty and character work ethnically based like Spanish, there'll be a, a number. It'll be a Hawaiian number. It'll be a Dutch number. It'll be a Spanish number. So those are inserted into the musical comedy to provide a different look. Musical comedy dancing is an umbrella term. It includes chorus line precision kicks and steps with our beautiful scantily clad Corrines. Any other dance type, including ballroom exhibition to aerobic dancing. Now, if anybody has watched these um, contemporary shows of Anybody Can Dance and, oh, what's the other one, you guys? Um, I was just thinking about it because the guy that got cut from this chorus line ended up being, so you think you can dance. Um, he got, he's a choreographer on that show now. It's a pleasing variety of steps and styles. So it's, it's really fun, it's entertaining. They're not doing one thing for so long that you're thinking, oh, another tap thing. No, it's like, oh, it's ballet. Now it's two people. Oh, look at the exhibition, look at the gown, look at the back bend, look at the twirl. So it captures an age and a style, allows for the tapping chorus lines, parading shows girls and back bend displays, woohoo. Imagine sitting in that audience. There is a reemergence of black musicals. There's a flourishing African-American culture of the Harlem Renaissance uptown Manhattan. It attracted the African-American audiences, even with shows performed in blackface and rooted in minstrel comedy. The audiences either came to be appreciative that they weren't doing that anymore, and that is a past culture, but it was still hugely attended. <coughs> Shuffle along. established the black musical as a Broadway phenomenon. A musical melange with comic routines, musical numbers written, directed and performed by African-Americans. Flournoy Miller, Aubrey Lyles expand the vaudeville skit into the book. Noble Cecily was a lyricist and UB Blake, the composer and created the ragtime inspired numbers. So you can see UB died in 1983, was still around in the 70s when they did 
the musical about him called Yubi. Balance snappy numbers, I'm just wild about Harry, we just listened to that, with sentimental ones, and it succeeded with both black audiences and white audiences. 500 performances in New York City. Remember at this time, 100 performances, you made your money back and you're considered a success. So five times that, toured for years in white theaters across the United States. And the influences of Shuffle Along are felt for years. Black stars are launched, Florence Mills, Joseph Baker, Paul Robeson. Eight other black musicals follow it to Broadway in the 20s. The greatest appeal is through dance. Dance makes jazz rhythms beautiful. The UB Blake tells it as our girls were beautiful and they danced and they sang. Running Wild in 1923 introduced the Charleston. And this is a dance craze that takes over the United States. It has flying kicks, shimmying shoulders, and syncopation. Oh my goodness, now everything's moving. And you're looking at everything moving because the undergarments have been thrown away. The corsets that were restricting the body up until 1919 are now gone. And we're looking at this very unrestricted figure underneath these flapper dresses. Sometimes the bust was restricted. Uh, to create the flatter look for the flapper, but generally it was a, a very uh, time of loose, loose undergarments. Hot Chocolates, 1929 was the hottest appearance of jazz. It was Sex, Dancing and Music, features Fats Waller stride piano, amazing player. Lyricist Andy Rossoff in Ain't Misbehavin' and Louis Armstrong is introduced, a jazz singer and trumpeter who goes on to incredible heights and musicianship. Jazz made the show modern and led into the next decade, starting in swing. So this is uh, the lecture from last time, but here's where you wanna find the rest of that PowerPoint. And I apologize, I did not make this full screen. I hope you could see it okay. Was that a problem? Did I put you all to sleep? I thought it was just fine. Okay. Yeah, it was fine. Because I know that sometimes I'll be in a meeting and they'll be screen sharing. I'm like, oh, wait, I turned my video off so I can get really close to the screen because they were this big. Oh, where I'm supposed to be, what are we supposed to be looking at? So if anything like that happens, please just holler it out, okay? So that we can uh, discuss. All right, a lot of material, a wild period. Doesn't that make you feel like gangsters are running around New York? Can't you just see it happening? Feels like ringside at a boxing match, MMR, MMA. Yeah, there's definite shift and yeah. material change and upbeat tempo and there's a huge shift. I just want to present a few more slides. I'm going to, I'm going to let my screaming cat in. Let me just, uh, I'm going to give you something to listen to while I do that. I would like you to listen to the sensation that was created by George Gershwin when he wrote Rhapsody in Blue. We won't listen to the whole thing. I do have it on your site. I will stop the recording so that you can listen to it. And I would, I just really want you to enjoy the moment. Let me get my screen share going here so you can, and I'll stop the recording. I'll play. 